Hey guys, we are supported by Sharpier's Bakery and we've been supported by Sharpier's Bakery for the last year. And I tell you, I couldn't be more proud of this partnership. Guys, they're a locally owned and operated bakery right here in Nashville for the last 36 years. Yes, they deliver fresh baked bread daily to your restaurant's back door. And man, is it good. You want to know what kind of bread they make? Go check them out at sharpiesbakery.com. That's C-H-A-R-P-I-E-R-S bakery.com. So they have over 200 types of bread. And if you're wondering, well, hey, look, it's a special recipe that I like to use that, you know, we bake it in our house and it's just, it's a kind of a pain, but we, we like to do it. They can take your recipe and make that bread for you without any of the hassle, the mess, the labor, They'll just deliver right to your door every single day. It is freshly baked. They love to give you a tour of their facility. Give Erin Moso a call. Her number is 615-319-6453. You should do it now. What Chefs Want story is incredibly unique. The owner, Ron Turnier, met with a bunch of chefs in Louisville back in the early 2000s and asked them one simple question. What do you want? And the chefs, they responded emphatically. We want deliveries on Sunday. We want to be able to split any item that you sell. We want a frictionless experience where we feel like we're being served. And so you know what he did? Something crazy. He did just that. So What Chefs Want is not only a company that's delivering fresh produce, fresh seafood, fresh custom cut meats, specialty items, dairy, gourmet, all of that seven days a week, They also offer 24-7 customer support. You want to call, you want to text, you want to email, you can talk to somebody 24-7. Get your delivery seven days a week in an amazing selection of products. That is what chefs want. So if you ever wonder, why do they call it that? That's your reason. Check them out at whatchefswant.com. Welcome to Nashville Restaurant Radio the tastiest hour of talk in Music City. Now here's your host, Brandon Still. Hello, Music City, and welcome to Nashville Restaurant Radio. My name is Brandon Still, and I am your host. We are not going to be joined with Caroline Galzen today. I'll explain in a second, but we are powered by Gordon Food Service. And every few shows, I just like to tell you that if you haven't gone through and done a complete audit of who you're buying your food from, if you're not happy with who you're buying your food from, and you don't feel like they're a partner in what you do, you need to contact Gordon Food Service because that is their mission. They want to partner with you. They recognize that your largest expense is with your broadline vendor, and they can make that a wonderful relationship to help you succeed. So wanted to throw out a shout out to Gordon Food Service. Love those guys. Caroline is on assignment. I've always wanted to say that, but it's uh, it's not true. She's just not going to be on this episode today. She's out of town and... This interview kind of happened by chance. A buddy of mine named Neil Sherman gave me a call and he said, hey, I'm going to be in town. I'd love to catch up. And I said, great, let's do it in front of a microphone. So that's what we did today. Neil Sherman is the CEO of a company called Tag X Brands. Now, he's been on the show before. Uh, This was in 2020, right? Smack dab in the middle of pandemic because what he does is he runs a company that sells kitchen equipment. He sells brand new kitchen equipment, but he also is the guy you call when you want to close your restaurant. If you want to close your restaurant and you need to sell everything inside of it, this is the guy to call. So I introduced him last time as Dr. Kevorkian, uh, which isn't appropriate, maybe a corner of sorts, but he is somebody who's in the know of how many restaurants are closing, what it's like now, and I really wanted to get his percept- pers- perspective back in 2020 to see if a bunch of restaurants were closing. And now we're kind of post-pandemic. I want to hear what his life has been like since that day. We talk about all kinds of fun things in this interview, what our projections are for the industry, what he sees, what I see. Just a fun conversation um, between people who haven't seen each other in a long time. And I thought I would share it with you on this wonderful Monday, Monday, Monday. 
Thank you to everybody who came to the Tennessee Tasting and Toast Nashville. Hope that you had a wonderful time. Thank you for everybody who went to our Instagram page at Nashville underscore restaurant underscore radio and you tagged a friend you wanted to take or you just followed us. We really appreciate every follow. And whatever you're listening to this on, go ahead and click the subscribe button or the follow button and you'll get notifications when I put these episodes out. Also, sometimes we do live conversations on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel that you can watch. I have 194 videos we've uploaded into YouTube that you can go back and watch some of your favorite interviews right now. You can see the actual interviews as they go down. So make sure to follow us on YouTube. And again, thank you guys for listening. I hope that you inter- in- I hope you enjoy this interview with Neil Sherman. One of those things. So. I did. I have hit record. Okay. Um, so it's officially recording, but uh, I can edit any of this, by the way. Whatever you I want. You don't have that. to edit. You don't have to edit me at all. We can talk you about say lost this now. keys. We can talk about lost keys. Are you willing to go there or no? Lost keys. Well, or you forgot your phone, and you know. Oh, we can talk about that. I, well, my phone is different because I have those air tags on everything else that I own. You know what I'm talking about. I do. I do. Like I've got them on my wallet, yeah. and I've got them on my keys. I've got them, and I've had to use them like three times in my life. I've had them for over a year, but when I needed to use them, it made up for whatever it costs. Because when you're like, "I'm late," where the f-? you know, and then oh, find my thing, and you walk around, and you realize you put a hat over your keys on the couch, and you're like, "How? How would never have picked up this hat on the couch?" To f-? But it just walks you straight there. I had. Um- I have been I've been accused of being OCD by my children and my wife. It happens, and it's true. And uh, <laughs> but one of the, one of my neuroses is to always get to the airport obsessively early. And they hark back to times like we as a family would show up at the Denver airport before the security got there oh, to gosh. open it up. <laughs> and so I was neurotic. And so I was on the road. We have facilities in Dallas and L.A. I went to both. I go to get the car in L.A. and I'm about to pull out, and it sounds like there's no car starting. So I go to another car, go to another car, and the woman goes, sir, they're electric. They don't make noise. Yeah. Oh, man. Then I couldn't find my license, so I lost my license. So after years of lecturing my children and not losing things, I lost my license and couldn't get around L.A. in a rental car, so I had to take Ubers everywhere. And then yesterday, (laughs) when I was going to the airport in Rochester, I told my wife, because we're going, she's speaking in Miami this morning. I'm here. What does your wife do? Um, so she's the real celebrity in the household. She's, well, let's, let's tell, oh, finish your story. Okay. We'll get to your wife in a minute. Okay. <laughs> so, so anyways, yesterday, um, when you live in a place like Rochester, you have to connect everywhere. So you have to leave very early. So, you know, I'm up at 3.30. Okay. Flight's at 6. It's 10 minutes from the airport. Small city. And we start leaving on the way to the airport, and I realize my phone is in the charger. After, after years and decades of telling my kids and wife, can't lose your phone, can't lose your ID, can't lose your passport, I didn't have it. So we had to drive back. And so do I as to, I say, not as I do. <laughs> and I, and I, I went on the forgive me, family, for I have sinned mode, right? Like confession. And I, I did it again yesterday. And so wow, I've been humbled. I've been truly humbled. That story comes about because I did that today. I was supposed to meet you here, and I and I couldn't call you to oh, tell you right. that I'm not going to. So I had to. I was 15 minutes. I was going to be here 35 minutes early. That's that's me. I spot on. I always want to be the one who's always there. I want to be like every single time I have a meeting. I'm like, oh, you're already here. Like that's kind of my thing. I right. I want to beat everybody to every meeting. Just like, oh, of course, yeah, I'm already here. Like. I'm weird like that. So today, though, I had to turn around. I live 20 minutes away. So I was 15 minutes into my drive to turn around to go home. That's why it drives me nuts, though. But I can't, you can't. I'm on the way home. I'm like, oh, I need to listen to this or I'll call this. It's okay. I got an extra 20 minutes. I'll call somebody. I'll do this. Nope. I just had to sit there and it was kind of nice for a minute not having a phone. It's wonderful. 
I didn't feel any stress of like, I can, I'm driving. I feel like driving is like the time that I can multitask. And I don't mean like I can, I, I get all the things I miss, all the phone calls. I call people back. I do all this stuff while I drive. I never just sit and enjoy a drive, which right. I, maybe I need to do. It was nice this to morning to do that. And without music or with music, either way. I guess we should probably do an introduction here. Whatever you would um, like. Super excited today to welcome in Neil Sherman to uh, back to Nashville Restaurant Radio. We Neil Neil was on the show on May the twentieth, two thousand twenty, and we're talking the restaurants. I think the restaurants reopened from the "We're closing you" like May eighteenth, May twelfth, May eighteenth, some, something in that week. That's how long ago it's been, and Seems then you're like decades. It, yeah, I mean, it really does. And so you were back in, you're in Nashville, and I said, and you said, hey, let's, let's have lunch or let's connect. I said, well, why don't you come in the studio? My fear was that we were going to have this amazing conversation at lunch, and we go, damn, I wish I had recorded that. But let's tell, last time I think I introduced you as like the Dr. Kevorkian of the industry, and I apologize because I, like, it was like my, 12th interview I'd ever done. And I've got you're a couple, natural. I've got you're a natural couple hundred it. under the belt now. But um, you're the CEO of Tagex Brands, and you're an amazing company where you take kind of brand new and used equipment, and then you sell it. So if your restaurant is getting rid of some stuff or it's closing, you can take your equipment, and then you 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 have a website, and people can go on and buy all kinds of restaurant equipment. Sure. So we we... After 35 years, I everybody says, what's your elevator speech? And I, I don't know that I could ever articulate it in conciseness, like if that's a word of, of an elevator speech. But we basically help people in various stages of the facility and equipment life cycle. So whether they're opening, remodeling, or closing a facility or a piece of equipment, we help with those headaches. Because as you know, being a seasoned, successful operator for many decades, it's there's so many things on the list to just get food out to the client, to the customer. And we just kind of deal with those events that occur not regularly. So, yeah. and uh, we started the company in DC and then grew it to 35 warehouses around the country, which was not fun. That's uh, a lot of, yeah, that's a, it was headaches. That's a lot of warehouses. Yeah. And we knew we needed a central place and we were mostly in cities. And um, in the 90s, there were a number of military bases that closed around the country. And uh, there happened to have been one in near my hometown, the place I said I'd never move back to in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York, uh, that no one wanted. But in the big cities, they just redeveloped them into other things. And so we bought this Army Depot that's a thousand acres in the middle of a in the middle of nowhere. And, and I think uh, you said there was like two point five million square feet. Right, right, two and a half million square feet. Not all of it with roofs, yeah, right? But minor, minor detail, but minor the, detail. The, the buildings exist. Some of it looks like post-war Berlin, but it's <laughs> it, we've made do. And we moved the company to Rochester, which is about an hour away, and we operate there. And then uh, we're national. And so we help people, whether they're a small, single operator or a big chain, uh, with these headaches of facilities and equipment. And then the what we're mostly known for on the positive side, not just the Kevorkian closing side, is that we operate what we've been told is the largest aftermarket place for restaurant and food-related equipment and supplies. Uh, meaning, it's it like you said, it's used in the recent years. It's it, about fifty percent of it is new surplus, um, and it's um, you know very inefficient market and chefs are always looking for value and always looking to save Heck dollars. Yeah. And capital equipment's very expensive. I think the pan people say, did you grow during the pandemic? So our, our marketplaces, of which the, the largest one is an auction platform called restaurantequipment.bid. There's a storefront called restaurantequipment.shop, uh, which is new, new surplus. And um, pre-pandemic, we get about a million views a month, right? The pandemic kicks in. Supply is challenged, not just in food products, but in equipment. Um, and people are have to operate. They need a flat top. They need a fryer. And they can't get it. So they're much more open-minded to the aftermarket. So it rises to about a million views a day. Wow. Yeah. You said a million views a week? Uh, uh, it goes from a million views a month to as high as a million views a day. And it's, wow. the auction is dynamic. So we're not like a broad, there's wonderful companies that offer a broad line of equipment and supplies and the big, you know, broad line operators. 
but we're dynamic. So some days there's a fryer and some days there's not. And you got to look at it every day. You got to look at it. Well, there's different auction events that occur and close and we ship from our facilities or it's locations in the field that, that are closed. So I, I, that's so fascinating. Um, so May 20th mindset, where were you at then? And what were your, you know, if you can take yourself back there, cause we just had our three year anniversary here. Congratulations, by the way, you've done an amazing job of taking those back of the house conversations that occur and bringing them out to the community. I mean, it's an amazing thing because people always, you know, the uh, kitchen confidential, you've opened it up to be a uh, kitchen open house. Well, I'm trying, you know, I think that it's definitely been something that has helped build the community, which is really our goal. Uh, but back then I didn't know. I mean, gosh, I was scared. We were just reopening our restaurants and I'm trying to do this podcast thing. I'm spending a lot of time with my family and you know, I talked to you because well, I'd met you at this event and I thought you would have a really unique insight as to what's happening out there in the world. Are people closing? Are they liquidating their stuff? Like what's happening? I don't, I don't know where you were at that day, but fast forward three years, did you expect to be where you're at today or and what is the current state? Cause I think you have a really unique insight into what's happening in this industry nationally. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting The when you read press from people in the industry, whether it be the big corporations or the analyst, everything's always wonderful, right? And the reality is, as you well know, is it's not always wonderful. No. I think if I go back three years, and again, I applaud all you've done with this show uh, to connect people in this community, I think the next stage for you is to broaden it to the, not just the Nashville radio show, but the national restaurant show. And um, there are other podcasts, but I think you provide a huge, amazing perspective on it. I think the uncertainty was always there for people in the restaurant food service industry. There was optimism because restaurant operators are fundamentally optimists. They have to be uh, to pull all the pieces together, the thousands of things that they have to do. <clears throat> I think that there was a, a belief that um, in distressed times, one of two things happen. People throw in the towel or they roll up their sleeves and do what needs to be done. And the, the strong survive. And I think in my mindset, I believed that we were always a good resource for people in turbulent times, whether it be in their concepts or with their communities when, it, when businesses were closing or they were, you know, Interest rates were up. They're up again. Oh, my God. Rent, rent is crazy still. Um, I think there really hasn't been since that May 20th, which you said it, we were the number 12 session on the... Something like that. I don't I mean... It was early. It was early. It was early. Yeah. Non-three digits, right? Non-three digits. No, it was definitely within the first 100. Right, right. So... I think that that uncertainty was, of restaurants was magnified. And, and I think that the... the perception of some people said, hey, I'm out. I'm not going to participate in the restaurant industry anymore. I'm of a certain age or I'm just tired. I don't want to do it. There, there were two good things that occurred, whether it be due to government intervention or just practical approach by banks and landlords, which was uh, either a stated or a s subtle moratorium on rent and, and uh, bank payments, you know, whether it be lease payments or what have you. And I think people say, well, that was very generous. I think it was very necessary. <laughs> it, yeah, it, was, it had to happen. They had no choice, regardless of the market of the country. And I think that that gave a pause to the, what could have been the true apocalypse of the restaurant industry amongst other you know, sectors. And I think that pause allowed people to regroup, reassess. Do I want to be in this business? Do I not? If I'm in this business, how do I get the people, the product, the equipment, the facilities to make things happen. Because you know one of the biggest challenges in our industry is people. And uh, getting people and younger people. When I was younger, and I'm a bit older than you, uh, and when you were younger, you worked in restaurants. You know, everybody worked in restaurants. That's Yeah. That was cool. And uh, I don't think there's, there's as much inventory of desire anymore to, to do it. I think the Internet's changed a lot of things for people. 
I think they, I think I read somewhere that like seventy percent of kids, when you ask them now what they want to do, they want to be an influencer. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, like it's like you know, if you ask a seventh grader what do you want to do, like I want to be an influencer because. What do you mean? I get my phone and I just take videos of stupid shit that I'm doing right. and then I can put on the internet and make millions of dollars? And that people pay me for that I mean, influence. It's I crazy. can if I was that age, that's what I would want to right. do. I right. mean, should that I don't I, know that I would have wanted to videotape the things I was doing as that would be cool because uh, you know, thank goodness there weren't videotapes around. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, I was like there was no way I should have been videotaped. Right. Right. And there was that was evidence, right? You just don't have the I don't know. I, I I couldn't imagine if there was evidence. I, I'm I've never dated in the internet age. I've never. I mean, I whole high school, college, no Facebook, no social media. Think about that dating app thing. It's it's kind of. I mean, I if it connects two people who are meant to be, so be it. But it was much tougher back then. You had to have you know powers of persuasion, and um, <laughs> yeah, it, worked, it worked on your shtick, you know, your line. So I, it, The idea that you can just go online and swipe left <laughs> or whatever and, and just have, oh, hey, you look cool. Hey, let's go out. Something like just the bravado to do that versus having to walk up to a girl somewhere and say in a grocery store, and be like, hi, what's your name? Right. Are you single? Like, like, I, do you know where the avocados are? Do you know where right. the, is that the line? <laughs> Oh, the pineapples, so, you know where the... I don't think there were avocados in supermarkets back then, so <laughs> that's, a new, that's a new kind of recent era. But you talk about that, you know, three years ago and the uncertainty and, and that I think that the people that are committed to the industry are there. I think a lot of people have always looked at the restaurant industry as if they come from another profession, whatever that might be, as how tough can it be, right? So it's like... You know, it's, it's, aren't, well, you, aren't you always perplexed by that? Is the people saying, ah, how, how tough can it be? I think those are the people that didn't make it through the pandemic. Correct. Correct. The ones who pre prior to the pandemic said, how tough can it be? I'll just open a restaurant. You know, right. I think Anthony Bourdain puts it really well in, in um, Kitchen Confidential. He says, the rich guys who throw dinner parties and at dinner party says, hey, you should open a restaurant. This is fantastic. And they go, maybe we should open a restaurant. And then after they open a restaurant and all the comps that they've comped all their friends to come in and eat a month after they open the restaurant and all of a sudden the dishwasher doesn't show up and they got, and they're there 12 hours in a day washing dishes. There's sewage coming out of the floor. The line cook is, you know, sleep with the hostess in the bathroom. And it's like, Oh, the, I, I got to generate, but this is an actual business. Indeed. Like what do I have to do? And, and those are the people I think that had yeah, a hard fall time. Off. It was well, a tough deal. It was tough. I think a couple things happened. One is, if you recall during that period, leading up to that period, there was always a question, what's the role of these delivery services, right? And there was a lot of them that were on the bubble. And who's going to pay? Is it the operator? <laughs> is it the, you know, both customer? <laughs> right. <laughs> they figured out both will pay. And what a good fortune for them that they had that event occur. They're the real Dr. Kevorkians of the industry. Well, they've done incredibly well. Yeah. And then what happened was a couple other things, and, and we could talk about this, but um, one is what I, what I refer to as the blurring of sectors, right? When we were kids, your father went to a gas station to get gas, and you know your mother went to a supermarket for groceries, and on occasion you'd go out to a restaurant as a family, and now you can go to what was a gas station and get complete prepared foods. And I think that accelerated during the pandemic is that some of these retailers realized that they were just a sales channel and that they could offer other things. So that, that put another competitive dimension into it that became challenging. The other was that we've seen unbelievable change in is this concept of ghost kitchens. Yeah. Right? And in my mind, a ghost kitchen was a great Wall Street thing to invest in. And people put in billions, literally billions of dollars into these operations. And many of them spawned and didn't have restaurant people that were part of their operation. So they built these mega commissaries, and they thought that they were going to put virtual brands in every market in America and they thought that there'd be enough traction for that to occur to compete against, you know, hey, it's a no, no right, it's a no overhead ish kind of concept. And what happened was those guys are paying the price now because we we are liquidating a great deal of that equipment, shall we say, that was in the the if come ghost kitchen world. Really? So, yeah. 
It's an amazing thing. They, it's amazing to me there were two, which will go nameless, that two of the ones that we've done work for raised a billion and a half each. A billion and a half dollars. That's more than I make in a year. Yeah, no, I know. And I can only make, <laughs> I can only look to make what you make in a year in a lifetime. But, but um, so they spent a billion and a half dollars. And because they were like, get it done, get it built. It's the pandemic. We are going to serve this. Well, then you need, as you know, there's a thing called perishable food, right? And so you need enough volume. You need enough traffic. You need enough people buying it to, to be able to do it. And then I think at the end of the day, as the pandemic, you know, in different markets of the country eased up and restaurants became open again, people have this burning desire to connect yeah. and be in a community and a restaurant or a bar is a place to do that. I think it's still happening. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that it's, I think it's going to last for another five years. Yeah. People want to be more. People want to be together, right? I was, I, 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 the pandemic was almost the great reset. You know, I think like anything, you, you don't know what you got till it's gone. That amazing, uh, is that Poison? Or is that Motley Crue? I don't know. I don't know. That's not my, I'm an Allman Brothers. Don't guy, know what so. you got till it's gone. But I mean, I, you take it away, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't realize much I needed that. All of the complaining, all of the Yelp reviews, all the things, all of a sudden it kind of reset. People were like, hey, I'm going to find gratitude. I'm going to find grace for the most part. Are the, they're outliers, of sure. course. But I think the thing to me that came out of the pandemic was innovation. I think there's so much innovation that came out of it in what kind of food we eat and how we pay people and how we hire people, how we market, how we execute. I mean, there's just so many really interesting things that have come out and I can't name a bunch of them for you right now. But as I sit and talk to chefs and I talk to restaurant owners about what they're doing and how they're doing it, I'm, I'm never ceased to be fascinated by, wow, what an, interesting way to do that how did you figure that out oh well, we had eight months where nobody came to our restaurant we had a bunch of smart people and we sat in a room and tried to figure out how to do it and you go yeah i mean i think everybody was so damn busy for so long just that quote unquote i'm just so busy that all of a sudden once you figured out that grabbed this whole thing you figured out oh my gosh i have to fire everybody and you go through that emotions of everything then became a, a really a moment of how are we going to real the, the real restaurant tours you know, I said, I've been really proud to do this show for three years because you can go back to May 20th and you can hear my evolution. You can hear me talk on May 20th. I'm like, hello, welcome to Nashville Restaurant Radio. Today we're speaking with Neil Sherman. And it's like, oh, you've done great. You've done great it's a stuff. whole funny thing, but it's really amazing to watch true leaders because there's no, there's no playbook on how to lead through a pandemic. But I've got to interview all these people. And I went back and I've actually listened to a bunch of episodes from... March, April, May, June, July. And to hear people's voices at the beginning of this thing, and there's there's trepidation, and they're scared, and they're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And now those people are crushing it. Right. But there is a lot of vulnerability. And I, I just love the idea of going back and listening to all these old episodes. It takes you back. Um, Will Gadara, you know who he is? Uh, how do I? He owned Eleven Madison Park, and he just wrote a book called Unreasonable Hospitality. And he became uh, he turned Eleven Madison into vegan. He didn't. Oh, a oh, successor did. I His guess. Successor, successor did. Successor he did. turned it into the number one restaurant in the world. Right. Sold it, and then they turned right, it right, vegan. Right. Which I don't. I, I I don't. I don't opinion about that. But he said perspective. He said his dad told him that perspective has a timeline, and that you know when he was younger, he his dad told him to journal throughout as he climbed the ladder because if you're a server when you become a manager your superpower when you first start is that you have every single aspect of what the servers are doing that's front on your brain a year after you become a manager you fall into the well now i'm a manager and you're a server and you see the manager's perspective he said but go back and read your notes from when you were going through that so that you can remain that perspective the perspective has a timeline and since that conversation, I've gone back and listened to these old episodes, and I'm like, "Man, do you remember? It wasn't it wasn't a decade ago. It was two years ago, right? Right. That we were all, what are we going to do? And now we're kind of roaring. It's great. I mean, obviously, the, the political landscape of this country is is a little wacky right now, especially here in Tennessee. But That's I'm just an understatement. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> yeah. 
But um, but don't you think? I mean, exciting I, times. It, it is exciting times. It's interesting. I I just wonder. You're in one of the most vibrant restaurant communities in the world, Nashville, in terms of its diversity, in terms of its passion. The, I don't think it's that diverse. Really? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I, the passion is there, right? The, I mean, you the have passion the, the is music, there. the music vibe, the the continuum of types of music that's here and the growth of the community. It's interesting. I was with somebody yesterday and they said, oh, you're from New York. And I said, no, I'm from upstate New York. They said, well, what does that mean? I said, a suburb? I said, no, it's six hours from New York. The town we're in is 1,200 people are where It is the opposite of New York City. It's the opposite of New York City. And I said, you know what? We're more Tennessee than Tennessee is today. We're more, you know, rural in nature. I wonder, though, you, you say that things are roaring. Things are roaring here. here. And I think things roar in some bigger cities. Other big cities have big problems. When you hear that sound, it's probably too late. You need a guy. I want to be your guy. I'm Kevin with Corson Fire and Security, and I'm a restaurant territory account manager. Do you know who's doing your inspections at your restaurant? Please reach out to me at 615-974-2932, and I'll be glad to come out and take a quick look and look at all your fire safety inspection needs. If you're building a new restaurant, we can help with that too. As far as kitchen suppression, fire extinguishers, emergency lights, we do it all. One stop, one shop. Call Kevin at 615-974-2932. Let me be your guy, Nashville. Hey, this is Jason Ellis with Nashville Super Source. We're so proud to be a sponsor for Nashville Restaurant Radio. We would love the opportunity to discuss your chemical and dish machine program with you. If you have any needs or any questions about your current program, opening a new restaurant, or just need a double set of eyes on that, we'd love the opportunity to help you with that. My number is 770-337-1143. We don't do any contracts, no minimums, weekly service to make sure that all your equipment is functioning properly. Make sure you have everything that you need. Again, my name is Jason Ellis, 770-337-1143. Are you a hospitality worker looking to purchase a new home? Don't settle for just any realtor. Use someone who understands your industry. Our real estate partner, John Ho, has a history in hospitality and is now able to help our industry through the home buying process. Along with his partner at Foundation Mortgage, they have the products and intimate knowledge of the hospitality industry to assist you in identifying properties to purchase and get you qualified for financing. Too often in our industry, we've been fed lies about the path to home ownership. The truth is, you don't need great credit scores. You don't need tens of thousands of dollars for a down payment, and you certainly don't need two years of employment at one job. Don't take chances with the one of the most significant purchases of your life. Trust people who understand the needs of hospitality workers. A team who is non-judgmental and is flexible enough to accommodate any hospitality schedule. And for you managers and executives listening out there, reach out to them to inquire for free information you can pass along to your staff. Contact them today to start your home buying journey with the right team. John Ho at 615-483-0315. Or you can follow him on Instagram at Hospitality. Amanda Gardner with Foundation Mortgage is 865-230-1031. Find her on Instagram at Mortgage Amanda. I wonder though, you you say that things are roaring. Things are roaring here. here. And I think things roar in some bigger cities. Other big cities have big problems. We're in Los Angeles right? They have a lot of challenges in the state of California. And yet it's LA. I've always been passionate of loving the weather in LA when you live in a place where there's, you know, there's two seasons, 4th of July and we've, winter. We've right? had LA weather here the past few days. Yeah, no, I know. It's been wonderful. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, by the way. We did that for you. Thank you. Yes. And so, but you go to smaller cities and they don't necessarily have the passionate people, the passionate restaurant leaders to, to endure the pain and suffering along the way, and you're left with the chains, right? So the chains have their own implication on this. The independent operator is one thing, but the chains are another. And how do you keep, you know, when you think of these, if had these operators journaled along the way, it's a tough thing to continue to recruit. You know, if you're, take that next step from a manager to a, a district manager, or a regional manager, and you've got literally hundreds of jobs you have to fill on a regular basis the chains 
I think in some respect, the casual dining chains have gone through incredible seismic change in recent years with the growth of really great independent operators. You know, they've, they've had their comeuppance. I think the quick service guys nationally have gone, you talk about trends. I know guys in Iowa who run chains of like 15, 20, 50, you know, burger places, names you would recognize, who chose through the pandemic to not open again to the public and only do drive through only do drive through Three people operate a Wendy's in Iowa. Three people. Wow. And so I said, well, why aren't you going to open? He goes, well, I'm in a small town in Iowa. I can't get people. Um, I'm adjacent to a college town, but those people don't want to work at a, at a Wendy's or a, you know, a Burger King. And so we've decided to operate three people. We haven't been this profitable ever. And so they only operate at any given shift with three people. It's, it's somebody in the, taking the orders, somebody kind of managing things, and somebody in the back of the house. Just making it. They're just making it. And I think that the, the other piece that's kind of interesting is the desire of people to try to – the home delivery thing is an interesting thing, right? So Amazon, you know, you, you see these pictures on social media of like 20 or 30 boxes on somebody's, you know – my wife did a really good job. She was very competitive in that, you know. I was saying, I think I think that's uh, reminds me of my front yard. Yeah, and and people just started buying stuff and you know delivering it to their house and and at the end of the day that became something that was more efficient, more reliable. But to your point, the the desire for community was not there. The desire to go grab a coffee and chat with the barista or go to a bar and chat with the bartender or the people sitting at the bar. You can't do that in your house. Or your friends. You know, my right. wife likes to go to the mall with one of her friends and they go into shops and look at clothes. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Let's right. talk about it. And they just, right. it's just a time they spend time together. Right. You don't it's do that community on Amazon. Thing. Well, I, correct. And I, and I think <clears throat> the question becomes what happens to the industry, right? And so what happens, you had this seismic once in a lifetime, like the hundred year flood, right? The, like the, the once in a lifetime thing called the pandemic. And then over time you realize, and you forget about the political landscape or chaos of politics. I find all politics dysfunctional. And I think that um, people are much more aware of, okay, this is the thing called COVID is here in some way, shape or form forever. When you think of the stats, my wife and I would always get flu shots and that the success rate of a flu shot is like 35%. And the success rate of a, you know, the uh, COVID uh, vaccine is much, much higher. So people are like poo-pooing the vaccine, but taking the flu shot. It's like, you got to kind of go one way or the other on this thing. And so that just becomes the way things are. And I think I was in a, you think of all the changes. So I got a call from a guy. I was in a guy's warehouse in Nashville, to be unnamed yesterday. And he had all these pallets. And I was like, what are these pallets? He goes, well, that's sanitizer. We converted our distillery to a sanitize uh, to to make sanitizer. And were now you at we're, Pennington's? No, 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 no. Oh. It, it was it was an uh, it was he like made a, a ton of a storage place, right? Oh, okay. And so so I, I go, what are you going to do with it? Because you have to pay to dispose of it because it's not good for the environment. And then some guy from Memphis called me, coincidentally in in your state. Uh, I have sixty four hundred pallets of wipes and sanitizer. I'll give it to you if you take it. And I was like. So 6,400, I mean, that's hundreds of truckloads of stuff. I said, I have no desire for that. So I think there's this, this hangover effect that's occurring where people are mopping things up, where people are dealing with things. The other thing that people don't talk about, and you have a beautiful downtown area here, is the percentage of vacancies in the office environment, which is going to have a huge impact on wonderful restaurateurs who do great lunch business, who great dinner business. I'm dealing with that right now. Yeah. In, in one of your uh yeah our restaurant Maribel is uh it's in a it's in an office park i mean it's over in maryland farms and literally there's you know a whole mile long street with office buildings that are half empty and it's, i mean our business at lunch is good and we're doing pretty well but like when all the offices are half empty it's it's difficult to right so that's I mean, a we'd, huge... we'd love to have those people back in their offices well, that's, and, and I don't think, I think people enjoyed, some people, a lot of people really enjoyed working out of the house. I think you had to operate that way. I mean, if you have a restaurant or you have a warehouse, you need people. But I think the implication right now, when you think of the economic turmoil, 
I think that people are lighter on their feet now post COVID and they're much more aware of being able to, to deal with things, right? It deal with chaos because chaos was the, the denominator of every day back in May of, right? Yeah. I, w- I wonder how that affects like the generation. When you think about generational gen, gen Z, gen X boomers, you know, the things like, I wonder if there's like a whole shift in gen Z because they were growing up during this time. And a lot of kids lost almost a whole year of school, all the homeschooling, all the, or if there's like some weird social disorder that happens with the generation or, or not. I don't know. Well, for people that are neurotic, it exacerbated it. Right. So, you know, if people are germaphobe, I mean, boy, COVID, what a great, opportunity to be legitimized right <laughs> see i told you i told you um but i think what happens now and i and it's it's coming to light for me with a lot of because we deal with locations that are remodeling or closing and move equipment and liquidated in the aftermarket is that the open mindedness to change is the thing that we all have to embrace and i think when you look at some cities in this country that have 50 to 55% office vacancy 50 to 55%. I was in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago and one of our clients has a bunch of restaurant and retail holdings and said, listen, you got to come to this office building in downtown LA. And it was a beautiful office building. And there were, I said, well, said to the guard as I was waiting, what, you know, how many floors in this building? And he said, 18. I said, well, how many are occupied? And he goes, one. I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, there's other people that lease here, but no one's coming to work. And so the little you know, luncheonette next door, not going to survive. No. You know, 17 of 18 floors not there. And so the question becomes, how do you continue to keep it real? The other thing that was kind of going back to the ghost thing for a second is that the traditional restaurant operators in this time of food trucks, ghost kitchens, whatever, is that those people came in and one of the things they thought they could do is just pull up a trailer somewhere and operate, right? And then they realized that the restaurant guy's like, well, wait a minute, I'm paying licensing, I'm paying taxes, I'm paying utilities. You can't just pull up on my curb and in front of my restaurant, in front of my restaurant and take my business. So I think that's another thing that's going through a lot of chaos. We have a lot of food trucks and a lot of food trailers available in, on our marketplaces um, for people. And um, the other thing you talk about change, I think that um, scratch made is always a wonderful thing unless you don't have the labor. Then you have to go to pre-made in a warehouse or in a, in a commissary, commissary in a commissary in a factory or something like that. And in some respects, it's more consistent. I see a lot, you know, it's interesting right now, and you'd appreciate this having spent so much time in the back of the house, is that I was saying to one of my guys, I said, it just seems like a lot of chains are doing away with conveyor ovens. And I said, what is going on here? And I start calling a couple of these people one chain is getting rid of 300 conveyor ovens and another one. And they said, well, um, a conveyor oven means that you have to be on your game to prepare the item going through the conveyor, to time it to temperature and everything else. And we don't have the personnel to be able to do that. So we're going pre-made, pre-packaged, pre-frozen, sous vide or non-sous vide, it doesn't matter. And we're just heating it up. At Dumbing the it down. Dumbing it down. And when you think, you ask what happens to this next generation, it's not that, um, I, th- I think there'll always be a, 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 an allure to the restaurant business, right? It's exciting. It's interesting. It's always fascinating. There's always something new. But I think the lack of basic employees is forcing innovation, as you had said at the top of the, our discussion, forcing innovation so that you don't just basically... You know, it used to be the apprentice system, right? You'd come up, you'd be a chopper, then a sous chef, and then you'd learn your work your way up, right? That's what happened. And now you don't have those people. Why do you? Why do we not have those people? It's not like all those people died. No, where'd they go? Um, I think, I think there's a generational shift. To your point, I think that people want balance, whatever that might mean to people. I think younger people see how hard their parents, grandparents, whatever worked, and maybe don't desire that seven-day-a-week lifestyle and want something that has more balance, the influencer thing. I can work in my bedroom, play Xbox, and then I can do all the other things, right? Um, 
I don't think that there's the desire there. So I want to play a TikTok for you. Sure. If I can get it to uh, play here, I'm going to try and figure out how to do this. It's it, and it's it's silly. It's a silly thing. <laughs> I send my family TikToks. They 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 are always amused by that. Do you? Because I I do the same thing. Like I'm always sending people TikToks. I I, I see or like uh, you get ignored by your kids and and your. Do I get ignored by your kids and spouse when you send them, or do they go, "Come on, Dad"? That's no. All right, well, let me find how to. How do I turn this up? I'm almost there. Does the National Re- Restaurant Radio Hour have a TikTok account? Oh yeah, well, we've got a lot of followers. Too. Really, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, all right, you ready? I'm going to play this for you. This is a a job interview with a millennial. All right, here we go. I'm just going to put. The- Right? Yes. Eight, like, in the morning, eight? Yes, in the morning. Yeah. That kind of doesn't work for me. Who gets up at eight? I do. I Skype with my French boyfriend in Paris until, like, three in the morning. I don't even get to Starbucks until, like, ten, where I order my grande <laughs> chai tea latte, three pumps, skim milk, light water, 2% foam, extra hot, but not too hot. So if it's okay, I work best in the morning at 1045. Wow. Maybe I don't think we're going to be a good fit. (laughs) Why are you so negative? I can sense your hostilities, and right now I am not feeling very safe. I've been here for over five minutes, and the only nice thing you have said to me was nice resume, which I typed all night for this meeting with you. You've given me no guidance, no validation, no encouragement, no supervision. Is there an HR director somewhere? HR director? Yes, I need to speak to someone. I may have to take off today as a mental health day. Take the day off, you... Amy, Amy, look at me. You don't work here. Are you firing me? Okay, yes. Brilliant. That is brilliant. I love that you have to send that to me. I mean, it's just one of those. It's it's scary. Obviously, but it's parody, but like it's it's a. Who wants to come in at seven o'clock in the morning and clean the restaurant and open up and cut lemons and cut slits and lemons and roll silverware and do all the stuff? Well, it's, the question becomes to those that are hardworking, to those that want to do it, the. The spoils will be theirs, will it not? I mean, if there's if there's fewer people competing for those jobs and fewer people doing it, I mean, the restaurant industry will always be attractive to many people for a whole host of reasons. See, I think it's coming back. Maybe I don't. I don't know what younger people wanting to participate or the restaurant industry. I think that the really talented people out there, the people who worked in restaurants who were could do anything, right? I'm a restaurant tour. I started a podcast, right? I'm, how many people started a podcast or did something it. different, right? Really talented people at Nashville. Real estate's going crazy. Hey, guess what? You got six months where you're getting paid by the government to to learn a new craft. I mean, nothing. I'm not saying anything wrong with getting, you know, being on unemployment, whatever it is. But what an opportunity to hit the reset button. I mean, I'm now I've got all this time off. I'm going to get my, I'm going to pass my real estate exam. I'm going to start building clients and the real estate market is hot as hell. I have the ability to do it before living paycheck to paycheck, waiting tables, 40 to 50 hours a week, cooking online or whatever it is. You don't have time to do that. Well, all of a sudden the pandemic gave everybody the time. And I think the really talented people in the industry shot their shot somewhere else. And they're either crushing it right now or at this point right now, they're going, I sure do miss the excitement. I sure do miss, you know, randomly getting a celebrity sitting at my table. I do miss that $500 tip you randomly get. I miss, you know, going out and having drinks and maybe hooking up with this person or that person. Like the, it's a lot more exciting work. I miss the camaraderie of getting the craziness of a Friday night being three deep behind the bar. There's an endorphin rush you get no from this. There is a joy and excitement. But restaurants, I think a lot of people are like this budgeting, you know, getting commission on a real estate am i going to sell the house am i not going to sell the house oh damn the deal fell through and i really needed that to happen for me and this sucks i need to go pick up some shifts hey i'm gonna pick up some shifts and guess what oh i really like this i forgot how much i like this i think the really talented people either made it or they're on their way back into the industry right now which is amazing for people in this industry because those people are i think they're trickling 
back to it almost out of necessity, which is giving lifeblood, I think, to people seeing good top talent come back in, which will then, I think we're taking the people that typically would have been, that didn't necessarily have the talent, like you're saying, the ones that couldn't use the conveyor oven, that now we have to prepackage it. Well, those people can go, we're bringing in more talented people. So it all filters everybody around. And I think we're going to get back to a new normal of, hey, I just want to come in and learn. I've had some of the best interviews over the past month and a half, people coming in. I just hired a kid the other day that I was like, how the hell are you not working downtown somewhere and like leading that place? I just felt blessed that this guy walked in. I'm like, we're just going to grab you and put our arms around you because the guy was sharp as hell. And we're getting more and more of that. And I like to think it's because we're operating really well and we're a desirable place to work and we have great benefits and we treat people with respect. Some of it's luck of the draw. Some of it's, hey, I was driving by, I'm new to town and I saw this restaurant and thought I'd pop in. You're like, great, thank you. You have great reviews on Yelp and we thought it'd be a cool place to work. But I see it coming back. I see Do you it think changing. that that's indigenous to Nashville? And in, in other words, Nashville. No clue. Na- right. I think, <laughs> I think Nashville is such a cool place. I know that it continues to grow at an unbelievable rate. You see the cranes downtown every time I'm here. They're all over. And, they're not even and, downtown. They're all over right, the city now. All over the city. And um, I think it's great for Nashville. I think other cities in America aren't experiencing the same explosive growth. Yet, by the same token, the restaurant is a place of community. It's a place of excitement. It's a place of making things happen. And because of change occurring so quickly, it's interesting. When I graduated from from college and grad school, there were a lot of people in the company. I went to work at Kraft. There was a lot of people in that company that had were lifers. You know, people would go to IBM for a career. They'd go to, you know, some manufacturing, GE or whatever. And that doesn't occur anymore, right, as much. People are much more transient. But in a sense, the restaurant industry offers excitement and movement and everybody, you know, parents always say, if you if you work in this industry... People always got to eat. People always got to eat, and People I don't. I, always got to eat. I go to I go to I go to groups sometimes. Uh, well, I go to AA meetings. I'll be, be honest with you. Right. And the other times I hear people sit in groups and they'll say, "I'm just kind of lonely. I don't get out. You know. I mean, I'm I do my job. I work from home, and then it's hard to meet people. And I'm like, shit. Come work in my, <laughs> come work in a restaurant for a month." You'll meet a thousand people. There's all kinds of people doing right. all kinds of stuff every night to get you work so close as a team. Like you have to build relationships with people. And it's a great way if you're lonely or you're like, and, and I, I heard somebody say the other day that loneliness kills more people than cigarettes. Wow. Did you know that? Like smoking is no. bad for you and it will certainly end up to, you know, negative health effects. Sure. But being lonely triggers more. It's it's worse for your heart, like for heart disease, right? It's well, than that, smoking cigarettes. Well, I, I it certainly affects your health, right? Yeah. So I guess it's that's interesting. That's what the guy said. So the um, I told you my wife is kind of a Renaissance person, and among other things, she well, tell me about your wife. Yeah. Your wife's the famous one of the group. Huh? She is the famous one of the group. She is. Uh, She's called the suburban outlaw, among other things. Um, and she speaks around the world wow. uh, about to help people present themselves and their stories with passion. So she started her you know, life being passionate about acting and was at an actress as a, as a child in New York and um, came from a family of doctors who thought that being an actress was like being an ax murderer, right? Really not a good thing. <laughs> So she went to law school and practiced law and was good at that. And then um, her wow. law, f- <laughs> well, she was a litigator, right? So it was uh, integrate the acting skills. Anyway, so she, her law firm kind of blew up. And instead of going with one of the other law firms, you know, at the time are, you know, we're dreamers. Uh, that's the other thing about restaurant people. They're dreamers, right? They, they're optimists. Um, she had a window to, to go pursue it. So she went back into acting and in DC, she was in a show called Sheer Madness at the Kennedy Center for three years. She was on a TV show called Homicide. And then we moved to this farm field in upstate New York and, um, uh, really tests a marriage, doesn't it? So she cried for three years. She's fine now and became a cheerleader. So she started writing a column of what, you know, 
what kind of husband would subject their New York City wife to a farm field? And it went syndicated in the USA Today network, and it was in 55 cities, and she basically ripped on me about <laughs> life. And so she was called a suburban outlaw, and it's, it's tough, as you know, with a podcast, it's tough for every week to, you know, you have the benefit of bringing in people. She had to kind of write the column, and so she started touring the world, telling her story and empowering others to do it. And um, so she's on the radio in, in Rochester, New York, once a week with the guy there that runs this amazing show. And um, so she's writing a book called uh, Play You the Role of a Lifetime, which is about using acting to find your true self, right? And you have your... Wow, everybody, interesting. Everybody has their own ways. Anyway, she was interviewing. So she's today she's in Miami working with the leaders of a college and then... We go to London, which is where we met 40 years ago, going to school. And uh, wow. she's speaking there. Um, but she was interviewing one of the Peloton people um, for Dick's Sporting Goods. They brought her in to interview this woman named Tunde. And um, Peloton exploded <coughs> and then imploded. Based on? Financially, COVID. Right? So people were, people were doing Peloton. Oh, I don't workouts their home workouts, they were, you know, they, the influencers who are these uh, people leading the Peloton classes, the, the teachers. So there was one woman who, uh, her roots, she was brought up in Texas. She's of Nigerian descent. And uh, they asked my wife to interview her. My wife had spoken the African continent, Middle East. Anyways, this woman uh, was talking about her life, that she was pursuing a life of being a makeup artist but knew that there was a deeper meaning, a deeper, you know, yeah. uh, mission for her. So she became a, a, a workout guru, you know, person, her own class. They have their own following, thousands of followers. And she was interviewing this woman, Tunde, and my wife was talking about uncertainty because the world changes constantly, as you know. And her quote that I wrote down, I was so moved by it, is that the beauty of uncertainty is a world of possibilities, and when you think about it, people freak out in uncertainty. They get fired. They, their comp businesses go out of business, et cetera. And she viewed it very differently as that someone told her this quote. She didn't give attribution. But when you think about it, this change in life is just the world of possibilities. You can, you can paint your own canvas of whatever you wanted to be. You in your head had this moment of clarity that said, boy, I love these stories of talking to chefs and I'd love to be able to share it with other people. And you created this show. and um, Which evolves every day. Right. And, and, but you're sharing other people's stories. Yeah. And you're, you're living your, one of your, you know, possibilities, one of your dreams to do that. And you're basically um, empowering people to follow their own voice. And you talk very openly about AA. I, I applaud you for that. There's a lot of people that don't talk openly about the challenges of their life. They put on this influence. You're talking about everybody wants to be an influencer. Well, the influencer reality is not a lot of people talk about the challenges of life. They just look. That's the other problem with social media. It's, it's a wonderful thing to connect people in a community and everything else. It's also depressing to think that there's somebody out there seeing this you know, rose colored. Oh Lord, that, that everything's perfect in family and everything else. And one of the things about, I applaud my wife's messaging because it's, it's about reality. It's not always wonderful. It's not always beautiful. Will you read that quote again for me? Sure. Is that the, the beauty of uncertainty is a world of possibilities. So we've done some, some stuff around this around the, that kind of that concept. And I do a book club where I, every month we read a different book and then we do a podcast about the book. Oh, cool. And a couple months ago, we did a book called The Comfort Crisis with, by Michael Easter. Have you heard of this book? I have not. You got to check it out. It's called The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. And essentially what it says is we as human beings at a certain age know what we like and know what we don't like, right? And we tend to live in a 72 degree world. I come in here at 72 degrees, get in my car, I move it to 70 degrees. I don't like to be hot and I don't like to be cold. You got to eat. I know that I like this. I'm going to try that. I like this. I'm going to try that. We don't get out of our comfort zone and we live in th if this is where we live. 
our potential is out here. And so I was driving, you know, I got I had this Jeep and I took the doors off last year and I actually wrote a speech to, 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 to speak somewhere. And I, I called the, so I want to do some more public speaking. And I, I titled it, um, I bought a Jeep and I took the doors off and I'm driving here on the way here. And I took the, uh, and maybe I'll record it and put it out as a, as a podcast. But the, the idea is this, I'm driving down the road and it's a two lane road. And then it moved to four lanes and I went to, to move and I couldn't see out the rear view mirror because I had something in the back and then the side view mirrors were on the doors and there were no doors on the car. I could not see behind me and I realized how important it is to look backwards in order to go forwards. And it hit me really hard in that moment that you have to try new things and you have to get out of your comfort zone and you have to constantly be changing and learning what everything is. That's how you grow. If I can't look back on the things that I've done or accomplished or the mistakes I've made or the successes I've had, how will I know what decisions to make in the future? And if I don't change anything, I'm going to constantly just stay in the exact same place. But if I branch out and I try things and I make mistakes and I go, oh, that didn't work. Well, next time I do something, I can know what doesn't work, but I've got to constantly get outside of my comfort zone and I've got to try stuff. You've got to try changes. It doesn't mean you got to die on that sword. If it's the wrong thing and you learn from it, then learn from it and move forward. But you don't have to, like, it's so important to step outside your comfort zone and change and do different things. Listen to a different opinion. Check out something you never thought you would like. Try everything in the world one time. And then from there, moving forward, where can you go? Because now you're looking back on this vast amount of experiences. That's why travel to me is so important. That's why just saying yes. Yeah, yeah. let's try it. Let's go. You know, it's interesting you say that because I think change is forced on people and they discover a new, in your case, rainbow, a new opportunity that they would have not pursued had there not been that forced change, losing a job losing a loved one, moving, whatever be the case. My wife would have never discovered being the suburban outlaw had we not moved. Is that her Instagram handle? Well, her it's it's the Pam Sherman. The Pam Sherman. The Pam Sherman. Okay. And so, but it's all her her various professional and chaotic things. She and she thought she'd never get on the stage again and she got asked to play a woman named Irma Bombeck who was an iconic columnist the iconic female columnist for many years who was, had, was in 900 papers and everything. She oh, was wow. a humorist. And so she's played this in a couple cities, and she goes, I'm never going to do it again, even though it was fun. She, you know, Denver, Denver, Buffalo, Rochester, she'd sell out houses. And this woman, Irma Bombeck, talked about life, you know, and uh, she wrote like 10 books. Life, you know, everybody thought that the suburbia life was wonderful. And she, you know, was in college. They said, you'll never be a writer and um, she wrote a book called uh, If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, What Am I Doing in the Pits, right? And it was about, you know, suburbia. Everybody thinks it's hunky-dory. It was the precursor to social media. And I think when you talk about experiencing things, you know, it's interesting. It's also not being paralyzed by the past or fearful of the future, right? My friends who operate in the in the in the walls of AA told me this quote that I live by, which is, you know, if I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, tell me if I'm wrong, if, I, if I'm uh, obsessed with the, you know, regrets of the past and fear of the future, I can't live for today. And so a lot of people don't take action like you're talking about. You wouldn't have created this podcast had there not been a light moment for you to figure that out. I wouldn't have created this podcast without my higher power in prayer. We are supported by Robbins Insurance, a local insurance agency providing customized insurance policies, sound guidance, and attentive service. Robbins Insurance is the go-to agency for hospitality professionals in Nashville. Listen, Robbins knows how hard industry professionals work every single day. They also know how devastating accidents can be, be it a grease fire that damages the kitchen, a severe storm that cuts off power, or a customer slip and fall incident. Both the extensive experience and the savvy to create a policy that protects your business from accidents like those 
you can rest easy knowing that the work you've put in will not be for nothing. Visit Robin's website at robinsins.com to request a consultation or call Matthew Clements directly. His number is 863-409-9372. Protection you can trust. That's Robin's. Do you provide your team with health insurance? If you work for a restaurant right now that doesn't offer health insurance, do you need health insurance? Because Dan Marr over at Southern Health Insurance wants to change that. If you're a local restaurant and you just, you really want to offer health insurance, there are so many benefits. Improved employee retention, you have happier team members, which means longer tenures and less training time. Smoother shifts make everyone's lives easier, meaning happier employees are more likely to stick around. When employees take care of their health, they're less likely to take sick days. This means reduction in lost productivity and revenue for your business. Fewer sick days, wouldn't that be great? You have improved morale, a healthy workplace with opportunities for growth is a happy workplace. Encouraging your team's well-being will result in higher morale and better work performance. Guys, all of these things, Dan offers health insurance. He offers visual insurance and dental, as well as life insurance. And guys, if you're out there in the marketplace, it's just too tough to navigate, Dan can answer any question that you may have. Any business, if you're a small business, it doesn't have to be a restaurant, you need to call Southern Health Insurance, 832-816-8602. If you prefer to email, you can email dan at southernhealthins.com. For you to figure that out. I wouldn't have created this podcast without my higher power in prayer. Okay, so meditation. Right. It's This isn't a religious God thing. What I learned was that I'm as insane and I tried to control everything in my life. I tried to control everything in this restaurant, that restaurant, and I was the master of my own everything that in my life I could control, I could control, and you can't. There's no way in hell. There's things that are out of control. It's the serenity prayer, right? Right, right, right. God grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change, courage to change things I can, the wisdom, no difference. When I learned that in the mornings I could wake up and I could meditate, have a mindful moment, and then I just say a prayer and I go, God, Whatever, you know, I, I give myself to you. I'm not in control. Do with me as thou wilt, essentially. That's kind of the prayer. That's what you have to say. And then you go on your day with And peace. it's not a denominational thing. It's, it oh, has no, 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 nothing no. to do with any It's religion. almost like a, just a personal. It's a personal reflection. And I could be praying. It doesn't have to be the Christian God. Right. Whatever my higher power is, that idea if you just say it, if you go into the day with the mindset that I'm not in control, I'm in control of the things that I can control, but the things I can't control, that's God's will. Right. And, you know, we were looking at this uh, uh, this thing, I'll tell you, that we wanted to purchase. And I said, is it available? Is something we could do? And I looked at my wife and I go, I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to say a prayer. And I'm going to go, God, if this is meant to be, then, then make it happen. If it's not meant to be, then make it happen. Either way, I trust that the energy in the world will put me in the right direction as long as I continue to do the next right thing. As long as I can be the best, the person, the things I can do the best, if I do those things, everything else will happen for a reason. Like not getting that restaurant back in the day or right. all these little things kind of add up and you're like, wow, I had no idea that things work out. They do work out if you trust and you believe in it and it's so le- so much less stressful oh, it's very much less stressful as you I, deal with change really easily yeah the the only thing that is consistent is change right i mean the only thing that we deal with in any industry especially our industry the restaurant industry. everyday life so with that in mind let me ask you this as you look ahead to prognosticate the guy who's had 300 plus episodes of the nashville restaurant epicenter here in the studio what do you see ahead for the restaurant industry? If you could hook your hat on what happens now, right? Because we're, we're the, I call it the purgatory of moratoriums. There was a period of time where landlords couldn't terminate people either by some statute, you know, state or federal. And uh, banks were not terminating and taking over assets because historically, if somebody took over a restaurant, a bank, landlord there were five guys lined up to go into that restaurant space 
and now there's not five guys. And so, and I don't mean the five guys burger place. I mean, like, there's five yeah, yeah, people, yeah, five or ten people. And so what happens now? What happens now is that it's kind of a level set to those things that were always the boogeyman, which was your bank or your landlord, labor you control, right, or not. You, 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 can, you can influence that. So what happens now? What happens to people in the restaurant space? We know that there's way more places to eat than there are gay parts. I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll go off what uh, Chris Keating said at the intro to the RLC, the Restaurant Leadership Conference, two years ago, a year and a half ago, I was at in uh, Dallas. And he said, how great has the pandemic been for us? What an amazing opportunity this whole thing has been. He's like, and he's speaking to chain operators. He's speaking to the the CEO of O'Charlie's was sitting at the table with me, right? And like all these different large VPs and presidents and CEOs of these huge chains. He goes, the dead wood has been burned off the forest of the forest. He goes, all of the dead wood has been burned off the forest. And now it's giving us room to grow. Now we can really thrive. And I just felt like that was the worst statement in the world for independent restaurant tours because it's true. A lot of people that aren't pro it's the game is stacked against independent restaurant owners. These chains, if you got 300, you know, restaurants, 20 restaurants, 50 restaurants, you've got a CEO, you've got a regional vice president, you've got a director of operations, you've got a CTO, you've got, they brought these marketing directors for IHOP and Applebee's and these people on the stage. So what do you guys think about TikTok? And they go, we don't really know anything about TikTok, but we hired four influencers to come in and they created our TikTok page, made 50 videos for us. And now we have 3 million followers. And I'm like, you can do that if you're IHOP, if you're Yum Brands or whatever it is, you can do that. You can't do that if I own mom and pop's ice cream shop down the street and you're trying to succeed and you're in the building all the time. I think technology is the real separator right now. I think there's so much amazing technology out there that solves somebody throughout the pandemic figured out every problem that happens in the, in the restaurants. And then they, they created a technology to fix it. And I think the large companies are adopting to really sophisticated technology where they're able to identify their, their market and then how they use that for marketing, the individual email blasts, the, understanding what your purchasing habits and how and they have people that can disseminate that data and then proactively use it to go after people. Independent restaurants don't have that. They don't have the time or the energy to really focus and invest on really good technology. And so that's one of the things I've wanted to do here on the show is talk to people like pop menu and toast and, go tab and bring in all these technologies that I see when I go to the RLC, when I go to FS tech, when I'm at these big conferences and I'm learning about all this amazing technology and I'm like, people, we need to use these things. These are things that are really, really important that will save you thousands and thousands of dollars, but help you know what to do with the data. The second a guest walks in the door, they're just generating data like crazy. How long did it take to get a greet? How long did it take? Did you wait? How long did you sit down? How long before your first drink? What did you order? What day did you come in? What time did you come in? All of these things. And if you come in every Tuesday at six o'clock and order a bottle of white wine and a steak with three people that all order kind of a similar thing, these chain restaurants know that. And they know that if they send you a blast on Wednesday, that says, hey, we know you come in on Tuesday, but on Thursday, the things that you buy are half price. Get you coming in two days. Incremental things like that that they have the data for because the technology now that they're using that independents don't have. And so I think there's a discrepancy in what's happening and the chains are, that whole idea of the dead wood is burned off the bottom and now we can really grow, I think is the scariest freaking thing in the world for independent restaurant tours because they're right. They're, they're, they can do so much more. But I think the general public realizes that supporting local is very important. And I don't know that any of the things I just now said are true. I, 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 want, I, I want to do everything I can to build the independence so they understand they are armed with the tools to compete. And I think the experience you get from an independent restaurant is a hundred times better. No question. In my opinion. And I want to help them. So how do you do that? 
Oh, you bring people like you on and you say, hey, look. <laughs> well, I'm not a you, technical guy. But, but you, but, but, but you're, but you, but just we've, equipment. I mean, well, all we've of- democratized, we've democratized access to the aftermarket. Yeah. So, you know, the whole thing about technology is how do you make it more accessible to more people? I think that the independent restaurant tour can be lighter on their feet and move quicker and not go up the line, up the chain to get approval on a menu change. They just do it. True. There's a lot of operators that, that are like that. I agree. <laughs> they can with raise you. prices. They can raise prices. They can do whatever they want. I think that access is key. I mean, the beauty of uh, one of the things, quote way back when with Bill Gates, was his vision. One of his ideas was, was to remove the intermediary from access. And when you think about it, you were you were landlocked, if you will, by whoever was in your marketplace. And now it's opened up to the rest of the the rest of the country, if not the world. And so, you know, that's a beautiful thing. I think I agree with you. I think that I, I'm optimistic, but I think it's the enthusiastic entrepreneur. There's always young people or old people. I mean, my wife and I, we sold the house we raised our kids in. We got an offer from a couple. We rented a place. Growing up in a small town, I didn't want to rent a place. So we, I, I don't have any hobbies. I just have my work. And we bought a hundred year old house. I thought it would be a fun hobby. In retrospect, it's not. Um, <laughs> we're in the house. It's beautiful. We love it. Uh, we told our kids the other day we spent your inheritance. So you, you, and your sister, you, you and your sister can figure out what it is. But there was a neighbor who said to me, are you retired? And to me and to my wife and my wife, she knows who my wife is. So she's not retired. And I said, no, I'm just getting started. And she was so perplexed by it is that I view the entrepreneurial route, whether it's individually or in, in partnership with other people, to be the ultimate high of enthusiasm. It's the highest of high. It's the lowest of low, as you know. Um, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because you control your own destiny. And 100%. in the restaurant business, you control your own destiny. And when she said to me, she just assumed because I was in the 60 range that I was retired, I was like, well, how sad. And then on the plane yesterday... I'm watching Warren Buffett be interviewed in Tokyo. He's 93 years old. His partner, Charlie Munger, is 99 years old. And these guys have no desire to do anything but what they're doing. And I think that that's an awesome thing. If you don't love what you do, then you're doing the wrong thing for you. And to your point, reflection, meditation, prayer, whatever it takes you to get there, that's what people have to do. I'm optimistic about the restaurant space. I think that in the end, the lighter on their feet entrepreneur can move quicker and just has to be able to accept change and not just accept the, the way things are. And I think the future is, is bright. Every time I meet somebody through our work, which is expanding you know, access to the aftermarket of restaurant and food service equipment, whether it be new or used, it's enthusiastic for me. I just am frustrated we can't help more people, you know, even though we have thousands of people looking at it all the time. So, but give me your plugs. Tell me because we're we're yep. we're past our time here, That's but fine. we could do this for hours. I know. What um how do people find you if they want to learn more about what you do? They need equipment for their restaurant or hey, look, I'm thinking of sure. closing my restaurant and I need you to come sell it. Sure. Well, they can always email me. It's n sherman uh, at tagxbrands.com, T-A-G-E-X brands, plural, dot com. The auction marketplace is restaurantequipment.bid, easy enough. The storefront is restaurantequipment.shop, easy enough. So and they, used as bid, brand new as shop. Correct. Uh, and, well, some of the stuff on auction is new. Oh. And so, yeah. So, and every every lot starts at a buck with oh. no reserves. With so, no reserves. With no reserves. So well, that's fantastic. It's, it's wonderful. And we so do some ship. good deals to be had. Oh, great deals to be had. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't realize that there's access to that. You know, a lot of the smaller independent, you know, aftermarket guys and markets have gone away. Do you do much business in Nashville? We do. We do. We have clients here. We are looking to put more of a presence here because when we, when we sell from a closed location, it's a one and done, right? So if we close a restaurant in Des Moines, we do an auction there. It's online. If you're not in Des Moines, we'll pick up. But then we have three anchor locations, upstate New York, this thousand acre farm, old army base, Los Angeles and Dallas, from which we ship. And we have good followings in those markets. Okay. Nashville, Florida and Atlanta and Chicago are the next 
places probably over the next 12 months. And so we'll have a hub here. And the hub is not open to the public necessarily because it's more of a pickup point for surplus. So, but we love Nashville. How can you not love Nashville? It's a great place. And you're here. You're here spreading the gospel of restaurants. Well, it's been and a for t- that. I'm grateful. I'm honored to have been here this morning. I appreciate you. It's nationally. It's been a tough place to love over the last two weeks. It's uh, unbelievable. Every day. I think there's a lot of love that came to Nashville a couple weeks ago uh, with the horrific school shooting, and then our legislature, you know, getting rid of uh, the Tennessee Three, and then them being put back in. Saw that. Uh, it's, it's just a lot. It's, it's been a lot here, but I'm I'm optimistic as well. I'm optimistic for Nashville. I'm optimistic for the industry. Um, I think that, look, all of these conversations, if it changes the way one person thinks or one other person can see a different perspective, one person learns about what you do and goes, I'm about to open a restaurant. I'm really looking for the stuff. I can't find a fryer. And they go to restaurantequipment.bid and they find it tomorrow, then that helps somebody. Right. An independent restaurant figure out a way to continue to to succeed and rent prices are going up and they're building big buildings everywhere. And I wanna I think that the the restaurant scene is our culinary is a, is kind of our cultural background as to what the city, the neighborhood seeing people awesome. meeting. It's really amazing. Okay. This, this has been great, my friend. Thanks I really for coming in, man. No, this has been a lot of fun. Well, to we'll, be at the epicenter of the, you know, the Nashville restaurant radio studio. Here. In the studio, yeah. In the studio, I'm on. Here we are. So. This is it. You got to sign the door. And I would love to. I'll All send right. you off with uh, some of my sponsor stuff. That'd be great. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you I so much, Neil. It. All right. All right.